Welcome to Yomrak Life for Wednesday, May 24th, 2017. This is show number 1135. I'm your host, Sean King. Thank you guys very much for joining me here live on Wednesday evening. Or if you're tuned into the archive, thanks very much for tuning in via the archive or however you so choose to listen to the show on tonight's show as always we'll be talking to our good friend jim dalrymple of the loop at loopinsight.com we're going to talk about the uh, tim cook wandering around in the real world with an apple supposed glucose meter prototype attached to his wrist which of course then made people think that he was diabetic and dying and all kinds of their stupid shit but we'll talk about that and what that means for apple I think it's a big deal. I think this is uh, Apple stepping into a field that they are unfamiliar with, which they've done before. Uh, but it has, I think it's a minefield in a lot of ways. But I think they are uniquely capable of getting into the health and healthcare related fields. So we'll talk to Jim about that. We're also going to talk about, speaking of health, uh, he posted a story up on the loop about closing the rings on your Apple Watch and uh, whether that makes a difference or not. We'll talk to him about that. In our starting point photography segment, we're going to talk about newbie mistakes I've made, things that I've done that hopefully I can help you not do. <laughs> there are there, there, Some of this, this stuff is very common. It's just embarrassingly common how these things happen. Uh, so we'll talk about those uh, later on in the show. As you can see, we've got a new backdrop. I've just moved to a new apartment. My fourth move in two and a, two and a half years. <sighs> Moving sucks. I was saying in the pre-show that wouldn't it be nice to have the, the, the money where you could just call up a moving company and say, here's my old address. Here's my new address. Here's the keys. Take the old place. Put it in the new place. I ain't packing nothing. I ain't packing a dish. I ain't packing a spoon. I ain't packing underwear. Nothing. You do it. I'm going to be in the pub. Call me when it's done. Because moving is just awful. I, and this last move I did by myself. All alone. I rented a truck and did it by myself. 12 hours of moving. I was exhausted. So that was not fun at all. Um... But it also means a new location, hopefully better bandwidth, too. Uh, I don't know if you guys in the uh, live show are noticing um, I've upped the bandwidth. Uh, I'm no longer in the boondocks. I'm going to up it even a little bit more and see if uh, hopefully it doesn't screw things up too bad. Um, unfortunately, it now means that you're looking at me in high def, which is, may not be a good thing. That's entirely up to you. Um, what else is going on? Moving new job something else was going on I, I forgot what it was nope nope can't um, can't remember but I'll I'll eventually remember it the I saw this a uh, very funny article um, it's one of those things that Amer- I think Americans um, don't realize in a concrete conscious kind of way that Canadians are different It's not just that we're separated by a border, but we're separated by a culture, we're separated by language. It's funny how many words that we have in Canada that Americans have no clue what we're talking about. Uh, One of them is keener. I didn't realize that Americans, until I moved down there, didn't know what the word keener meant. And keener is a, um, someone who's extremely eager to please. They're keen. And th- they're eager to please in an annoying kind of way. So a keener is, is uh, mostly a, 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 it's kind of like an overachiever, not quite a brown noser, but someone who's just really, really keen to do stuff. It, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not a term of endearment, that's, shall we say. Uh, another thing I didn't realize Americans had no idea of, a Mickey, when it comes to booze, a Mickey is... Um, uh, it's shaped like a flask, but the same size as as a, a flask of booze. Um, it's three hundred seventy five three hundred seventy five milliliters of booze, so it's not a full bottle of, of booze. It's just a, 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 a small little, um, I, I guess carrying carrying a case of of booze. Um, I didn't realize that Americans, what you guys call uh, sneakers. Uh, we call runners here in Canada. 
they're interchangeable. And I think a lot of Canadians call them sneakers as well. Uh, but we also call them runners in Canada. I remember the first time I mentioned I had to buy runners. And someone in Nashville went, well, what are you talking about? That's when I realized that they, the Americans don't know what runners are. And what you guys in America call uh, uh, bachelor parties and bachelorette parties, we in Canada, although we use bachelor and bachelorette parties, we also call them stag and stagette parties. Although I think a stag party back in the 50s meant something different. I think, uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure, but, but a stag party for us here in Canada is a, uh, what, what a bachelor party would be down, down in the U.S. Um, trying, this is a list of, uh, a two, four. Now Americans, you guys call a two, four, a case of beer, 12 beer for some odd reason. But a, uh, Mac man says we do uh, in Nashville, in down south, people called a two a case of beer, uh, uh, a a two four I think. Um, here in Canada, two four is twenty four beer. It's a or a flat, a beer. You know how you see a, a cans of beer in, in the in the cardboard, the low cardboard box. It's called a flat of beer. It's also called a two four because there's twenty four beer in it, which makes perfect sense to to me. Um, those those um, I never liked them as a kid. Those uh, frozen um, uh, ice ice treats that uh, they're flavored, uh, they're basically just sugar water, frozen sugar water, uh, called freezies. Um, I don't think you guys have, I don't think you guys call them free. What do Americans call those things? The frozen tubes. Um, not popsicles. No, not popsicles. These, these don't have a stick. They're, they're in a plastic wrap. They're usually about eight inches long, and it just, it's just frozen water that's flavored and colored. So it'll be blue and red and green, that kind of stuff. Um, they're, here, I'll show you the video. Well, it's not video. I'll show you the, uh, those things. That's what we call freezies in Canada. But Americans don't seem to, don't seem to call them that. Um. It's kind of interesting to, to to see these these differences of things that are are common between the two countries, and yet still different that they they that they would have a completely different name to them. This is something I uh, definitely Americans don't have is a toque. Um, a toque is just a little, uh, usually a wool cap. Uh, it'll come down to your ears, but it's and you've got a design on it. Uh, my favorite one has got Hockey Night in Canada on it, but it's called a toque, T-O-Q-U-E. Um, I, I, I guess Americans would just call it a knit hat for the most part, uh, but in Canada we call it uh, a toque. When uh, Larry the Cable Guy, the comedian, um, has his get her done thing, in Canada we, we will often say giver. G I V E R giver. It means the same kind of thing. It's it's quite kind of stupid. It's very it's a very rural thing to say. I don't think too many people in the cities ever say giver. The funniest one though is I didn't realize how potentially offensive this was until I became an adult. Homogenized milk in Canada. We call it homo milk homogenized homo milk i didn't realize till i was an adult that that homo was an insult because for us it's just it's just milk that's what you call milk and remember in canada a lot of us have or used to i don't think too many people do anymore have milk in a bag too which always confuses americans um yeah mac man says that has a double meaning yeah it does uh, wayne posted um uh, in the Slack chat room, uh, the freezy. It's called a freeze pop in the United States, but a freezy in uh, in Canada. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, but yeah, you used to ask for homo milk all the time. Your mom would say, "Go, you know, go, go get some homo milk," which is you know kind of funny nowadays. Um, this is uniquely Canadian. Double double. Every Canadian knows what I mean 
when I say double double, it means you order coffee from Tim Hortons and you want them to put in two measures of cream and two measures of sugar. So you can get a single double or a double single or whatever it might be. But a double double is um, two creams and two sugars. Uh, Timbit is also, uh, basically it's a donut hole. Um, but it's also u uniquely Canadian. Uh, and this is something I didn't realize Americans didn't call um, parking garages, parkades. We call them parkades in, in, in a lot of places in Canada. Uh, but they're called parking garages in in the U.S. Uh, and obviously everyone, probably most Americans, even know what a, what, what, what a toonie is. That's a two-dollar coin. We have a loony and a toonie, the dollar coins that we have. Um, when you go to a, a restaurant or even at home and you have a cloth that you wipe up spilled with or wipe your face off, Americans call that a napkin. We call it a serviette. I don't know why we call it a serviette. That's obviously a French word, but it's common throughout Canada called a serviette. Uh, washroom. We ask for where's the washroom at? The bathroom or the restroom. It's supposedly a polite word for bathroom, but I, I don't I don't know one way or the other. I'll post these in the Slack chat room. Um, Chesterfield. It's something a lot of Americans have never heard of. A Chesterfield. A Chesterfield is a, um, a, a couch or sofa. I think they're pretty interchangeable. I think I don't think there's anything different between a Chesterfield, a couch, or a sofa. I think they're all pretty much the same. Um I didn't realize this this wasn't uh, Canadian either. Or sorry, it wasn't American. A garburator. You know what a garburator is? It's a trash compactor or trash disposal. For some reason in Canada, we call them garburators. I've never, I, I didn't, again, I, one of those things I didn't realize wasn't universal. Uh, house coat is a bathrobe. I think that's common in the U.S. too. I'm not sure. But there's a whole, all, all, all kinds of um, funny little terms that separate Canada and the U.S. Um, college. When we say college in Canada, we're generally referring to a community college. But in America, you've got universities and colleges are interchangeable. Uh, Four-year degree-granting institutions are the, are the same. Um, pop and soda. Uh, are, 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 are different words um, so it's always it's always interesting to 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 see how these two cultures who are so close together and so reliant on each other in so many in, in in so many ways can still differentiate each other not on purpose um, but just from the way these words come about a lot of our words are French toque and serviette and things like that but a um, a lot of words that are, have the same um, association in the U.S. have different words in in Canada. And again, this stuff always always fascinates me. Later on the show, we're going to be talking about newbie photo mistakes that I've made. I'm going to try to help you not make them. But up next, we'll talk to our good friend Jim Downpool of the Loop at LoopInsight.com about Apple's glucose meter and what that means for the company. All that and much more coming up. This is your Mac Life.
Welcome back, folks. Thank you guys very much for joining us here this Wednesday evening or live on the archive as you so choose. We've got a good friend. Jim, come on. I said live mics. What? What, what? I didn't do anything. You're making noise. I'm not making any noise. You liar. <laughs> My God. We, there was a couple of uh, health-related things last uh, week that I wanted to talk to you about. First of all, uh, Tim Cook wandering around out in the real world, supposedly with an apple glucose meter. This obviously means he has diabetes is gonna, and going to be dead in six months, right? <laughs> or, you know, being the CEO, he could just want to test it and see how it works. This is interesting, though, that, I mean, Tim Cook is a smart guy. He knows people pay attention to what he does and how he does it. This was intentional on his part, wasn't it? Oh, of course. You, know, you mean letting people know that he had it? Yep, exactly. Oh, of course. Of course. So why do you think he did that? Why not? <laughs> no, I mean, it's going to be one of those nights, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> everybody knows that, that one of Apple's uh, big pushes over the past few years has been in health. And, you know, if Tim has something that can you know glucose level or whatever it is that is being measured um then you know why not let a little info slip he can he's the ceo he's definitely doing this to let other people know that apple's working on this too this was a message sent out to microsoft and google and oh, yeah. amazon and everyone else like that the interesting thing about it is that this is a field apple has not ever been in before the health and health care related it started off slowly like everything apple does but it's also i think a bit of a minefield too especially i think this is you and i talked about this for for years apple signals things well in advance of what they're going to do so they started off with the whole the the apple watch and the fitness aspect of it and also concurrently telling people about privacy how strong Apple is going to be in privacy, because that is huge when it comes to healthcare. You right. don't want your health data just out there. Well, it's different. Having your healthcare data be available freely is a lot different than having my browsing, uh, having Google be able to search my browsing history. You don't want anyone to know your health and, stuff. And, and one could be the result of the other when it comes, but you know, exactly. That's a, exactly. That, that's a different. That's a different story. <laughs> it's, why do you think Apple is doing glucose monitoring first? Well, I think that they probably figured out a way to to be able to do it, and you know, I mean, no matter who you talk to, you're going to come up with a different answer of what's really important. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm sure that Apple would love to cure cancer. Uh, you know. Uh, have it pop up on your phone. Guess what? You have cancer, but we have a cure. No problem. Yeah. You know, so they have to, to pick and choose what it is. I mean, what, what is some of the, uh, the, the diseases or ailments that, that they can attack right now and make a difference in? Well, this is one. This will help a lot of people. As Arxine points out in the IRC chat room, he says the watch already monitors heart rate and the iPhone collects other vital signs from devices already. Apple, yeah. again, dipped its toe in the market. And I think the other aspect of this is that there is enough of a market for people who need and want to be able to monitor glucose. But it's not such a huge market that Apple has to worry about getting too far into it. I think there's approximately uh, 2 million people uh, yearly who use uh, the various kind of glucose meters, ones, ones where you uh, prick your, your finger to find, find uh, to get a little drop of blood, you put it in the meter, and it, and it reads the, your glucose out for you. But that's the thing you got to do every X number of hours. If they could have a, a proactive device that sits on your wrist that somehow, I don't, I don't know the technology behind this, but somehow can measure your glucose through your wrist, on an ongoing basis, that's going to be almost like magic. And it's going to be very, very Apple-like, isn't it? Yeah, well, I would think so. I mean, you can't think that it's you're going to put the watch on and then it's going to, you know, like chart a needle into your wrist or something. <laughs> <laughs> Every two hours. Oh, shit! <laughs> 
you know, I, I can't think that's going to happen. <laughs> um, you know, you look like uh, you have track marks or something on your, <laughs> you know. No, that's just my Apple Watch. Right, I, I, right. I, 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 I think that may tend to, to scale back sales a little bit. <laughs> just but, a little bit. <laughs> you know. But it's the the idea that Apple can do this, will do this, is signaling they obviously are going to do this. I think is absolutely fascinating that the, the methodology or the way they're doing it, the fact that they're letting people know that this is where we're headed. Uh, as um, Monty says in the IRC chat room, that the HIPAA laws here relating to health information are a mess. Apple is smart to go slow into that quagmire. I think that's another, oh, yeah. that's another aspect of this, too. Apple knows what kind of hairball they'd be jumping into if they got too involved in this. This is something that could be very personal. Oh, Jesus. Are you recycling beer bottles? No, I'm getting a new one. <laughs> that, that this is the kind of data that can stay on your wrist. It doesn't have to go anywhere. You don't need to send this data to a doctor, to... Uh, a hospital you can look on your wrist because every person who needs to, to um, track their glucose knows what range their glucose needs to be in. They don't got to consult with a doctor. They don't got to say, hey, my number 75. What does this mean? They already know. Yeah. So Apple's not going to have to get involved in any kind of sending data somewhere else or anything along those lines. I think this is a really interesting and yet still brilliant idea. But it it opens up the door for for more tests where you can just sign in and share your data with uh, with doctors and things like that. So, you know, there's all kinds of things that that Apple can do. And it also is very um, consistent with the way Apple does things. People somehow seem to think that Apple just jumps into things. But as I said earlier, they signal what they're going to do ahead of time. All you got to do is pay attention and, and read the tea leaves from six months, a year, 18 months ago. And you can see these are the kind of directions that Apple is going in. Yep. I don't think Apple's going to become, per se, a healthcare company. I think they're going to become a healthcare technology company. Not see, everything, but. It's, di it's different, though. Yeah. Because Apple is. is Sorry, Jim, I've lost you. Huh. Still there? All right. I'm, I'm here. You said Apple is? Apple is looking for ways for uh, uh, to, to help doctors help patients. No. You know, they're not looking to be a healthcare company. They're looking to better uh, health care. But by providing information and allowing doctors to, to work with uh, people from all over, you know, that's that's the type of thing they're doing. So I don't know that they'll be a healthcare company as much as they're being um, a, a source between the patient and the doctor. I think, I don't know about that, I think that Apple, at least in these, these initial early stages, is looking to provide the patient with data, then the patient decides what to do with that data. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, there's two sides of this, though. Yeah. But look at all of the studies that all of a sudden had, you know, uh, thousands of people signing up for yeah. it because of the information that Apple could provide. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's helping patients, it's helping doctors, it's helping research studies, it's helping all kinds of things. So, you know, the watch is just one way that Apple can uh, put this information out there for people that want it. The other thing is, too, and this is great for Apple, that means that there's going to be X number more sales of Apple Watches. I think yep. this this helps Apple both in a um, uh, in a way of helping people, but also helps the company's bottom line. I think there's not there's this is a win win for Apple, and I wonder if other companies are scrambling to develop their own technology along these lines, or do you think this is something that that the Samsungs of the world are going to allow Apple to do because it's too hard for them to do? Well, I I think that people will try. Yep. I really do, but 
you know, you, you really have to wonder about uh, privacy and you have to wonder about, you know, what happens to all your data when your Samsung phone burns up. Um, <laughs> You know? <laughs> I think that, that's an on, on, I mean, not the Samsung phone burning up. I think that's a, a definitely a, I wonder if Apple's going to pimp that idea that, Hey, we are the company you can trust with this data that, that these other companies aren't, or are they going to allow the market to do that kind of um, advertising for them? Do you think this is something that Apple would be proactive in saying, hey, you can't trust the other guys, but you can trust us? I, I think that Apple has, so far anyway, has been very, um, I don't want to say good. They've been very, uh, they, they've let their actions speak for themselves. Yeah. So so they know that um, that there's, an issue with privacy in the world all over yeah. and, and people know that they stand for, uh, for privacy. So I think that they, they're letting that speak volumes. And I think it does yeah. when you, when you look and there's, you know, millions of malware things on Android and that's what most of these phones are running. Yeah. And, you know, that, there you go. I think this will significantly increase Apple's reach into the Android market. I think this will be one of those things that you they'll be very e- it'll be very easy for them to say to potential customers that this is the best thing for you that you'll be able to do what you need to do and do what you want to do on this device and not on your Android device. I I think this is going to be really interesting to watch to see how Apple pulls this off. As uh, Wayne says in the uh, Slack chat room, uh, they'll have to convince people they're not selling this info to health life insurance companies. I don't know that it'll take that much convincing, though. I think Apple's, as we said before, Apple's done a good job of signaling this. I'm sure there will be some commentary on that, but I don't know that it'll need to be very overt. Well, and and that's the thing that Apple has been very good at over the past few years yep. is that your your data is safe with us. We're not, you know, we're not in the business of selling your stuff like Google. Is. Yeah, that's right. Google, Google Google is in the business of selling your information. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, Apple has been very clear that that's not their business. Yep. So. I, I don't know if it'll take a whole lot to convince people, but Wayne has a good point in the fact that if we look at this, as as I always say that we should, from a consumer standpoint, maybe the consumer just doesn't pay enough attention to that to mm-hmm. know. And they'll still be afraid that Apple, so they may have to make a concerted uh effort for education to say no this is your information yeah, we don't right. we don't want it we don't know what it is it's encrypted it's yours yeah. speaking of uh, health related things you posted a story on the loop it's not just about closing the rings with the apple watch what do you mean by that well i i get emails and twitter questions about um the health and fitness all the time. Yeah. Um, and people, uh, I actually got one email after I posted that story from a gentleman that uh, had cancer and he can't exercise every day. Yeah. So he can't close the rings and people find that frustrating because they have the Apple watch and they can't close the rings every day. And, you know, they want to, yeah. But they can't. And some people, they don't have a disease. They're just, you know, overweight. They they can't exercise a whole lot each day, but they're trying to do something. And the the point that I try and make to all of these people and in the article, excuse me, the article was it, it doesn't matter if you close the rings. What matters is are you doing more now than what you were before? Yeah. So rate yourself against yourself, not against what what Apple says. It's great to have that tracking, 
You know, it's great. If you can only do 15 minutes, well, what were you doing six months ago? Nothing? Well, then, you know, you're doing 100% better now than what you were six months ago. Yeah. And you, in a year, you may be doing 30 minutes. And, and that's that's even better. But just do something and rate yourself against what you were doing before. Don't worry about closing the rings. If you can close the rings, good for you. But that's not what it's all about. One thing I'm curious about when it comes to the Apple Watch is um, I know on my, I've got a little um, uh, knockoff. Uh, it's called a Striv, but I like it. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not bad. It does what I want it to do. But I set what the number of steps I want to accomplish uh, on a regular basis is do you set the ring numbers on the Apple Watch? No. Does Apple do, see that's that's a, one of the downsides. Is Apple is telling you you must do this this many steps when maybe you can't do that many steps. It's, it, it's only a downside if you pay attention to the rings, and that is the only thing that you pay attention to. But the rings are a sense of accomplishment. That's why people want to close the rings. If if, if Apple has, if Apple has the ring set at ten thousand, you can only do two thousand. Then you you feel bad about not closing the rings. If I could I set it. the ring uh, uh, parameters to be two thousand, then I could close the rings. But then you would you would uh, feel empty on that because then you know you come out gaining sixty pounds because you eat all that food and you know you still closed all the rings. What's the point? I I think that Apple sets those based on guidelines from uh, health authorities. Yeah. You know, this you should do thirty minutes of exercise uh, a day. Yeah. And you should stand for 12 hours a day. I, and that is, is, it's not physically possible for, for a lot of people to do. That's yeah. why I said, rate, rate yourself. You know, if this is what you can do and you can exercise three times a week, that's great. Yeah. That, that is so great. You know, and be happy that you're doing that. And look at those days and say, wow, you know, six months ago. I was only doing five minutes of exercise. Now I'm doing 15. Yeah. You know, that, that's why. And maybe the calories you're burning are, uh, you know, 200, uh, you know, instead of, I don't know, you know, what does the, the Apple Watch may want you to burn 500. Yeah. Well, who, who cares? You can track your own progress, and that's what you need to do. Yeah. So that was the whole point of it. And I got emails after that uh, from people that just said, thanks. Yeah. You know, I did get caught up in in this whole business of trying to close the rings. And, and the sad part is for athletes and for people that are physically fit, they can close the rings. No problem. Yeah, they, right. they probably close the rings multiple times over yeah. each day. And, and that's fine for them. But not everybody is in that situation. Yeah. But that's why I say it'd be nice. Like, like I said, on, on, on my striv, I can set the daily goals to be 5,000 steps or 15,000, whatever I want it to be. And then you know that you're accomplishing it. But you were right. I think part of the problem is that we're all – or some people are, are, are just competitive. They're even with their friends or even with themselves, they're competing with the Apple Watch. They want to close those rings. But you're right. You can't – get down that's one of the problems with, with exercise in general is that we have these high expectations of exercise and if we don't see instant results and closing the rings is an instant result then we stop doing that thing instead of just saying oh well i didn't i didn't close the rings today tomorrow's a new day kind of thing but you know uh this happened to me two years ago yeah. um i i was so intent on closing the rings and doing better than what I had previously done. And I, I pushed myself way too hard. Yeah, yeah. More than, than what I could physically handle. Yeah. And, and I, I injured myself. And, and I wasn't doing anything really strenuous. I mean, everybody knows I, I walk and I, I lift a little, but yeah. uh, mostly it's walking. <clears throat> and I actually had a physical injury that put me put me down i i couldn't walk anymore and it was my own fault because i was trying to i i mean i the the 
because of you know the weeks leading up to this point i had been you know kept pushing and pushing and pushing that the the goals for the apple watch increased and i couldn't meet them yeah. and it just drove me crazy <laughs> so I, I i went out and just you know pushed and pushed and pushed then i get injured and i couldn't i couldn't physically walk so you know what do you do then well i would have been better off just to keep doing what i do and keep that that level of exercise but i did you know i get caught up in in the rings so there you go i know you're a big fan of spotify uh, spotify has a new deal for unfortunately only americans um, mm. Unlimited music premiums for you. Three months for ninety nine cents. Off ends June twenty six. Is that a good deal? Well, yeah. I mean, obviously, it's a good deal. Do you like premium? I know they just came out. Didn't did they just come out with premium, or did you just sign up for premium? No, no, no. They they've had premium for a while. I, um, what are the adva- but, What are the advantages of Spotify Spotify Premium over Apple Music? In in your opinion, uh, you know. Uh, Oh, I, I'm at, these days I'm using Apple music and, uh, Pandora premium. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, Spotify, I found, I found the interface very awkward mm-hmm. to you. I know a lot of people like it. They have millions and millions, tens of millions of customers, but I found the, the interface very awkward. Um, it, it is a good deal. I mean, for, for 99 cents, I think people should give it a try for sure. Um, but I, I don't know. I, yeah, you know what? I mean, I had, I had someone ask me the same thing and uh, for 99 cents, screw it. Just try it. I, I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I haven't tried it, but if you're, if you're American, if if, if, if you qualify for this deal, it's, it's just a buck. Don't ask anyone's opinion. Just go ahead and do it and, and, uh, and see whether you like the service, see whether it's, it's interface, something that you like. If Jim doesn't like it. Maybe you will. It's, it's all a personal, personal choice. See if, if the kind of music you want is available, is available on, on Spotify. There's no point in asking other people their opinion for something that's no. 99 cents. I, a music service is, is also, uh, something that's very personal. I yeah, think, sure. I mean, do, are, do they present the type of music that you like yeah. and in a way that you like? so that you can find it and you can listen and you know they have the songs that uh, you expect to hear all a very personal thing yeah you know i i think the best interface right now uh, you know even though it has some problems i think the best interface is is apple music yeah apple music has the best so you know it, it, it's a very personal thing though I mean, you, it, it's like going to watch a movie. Do you, do you like this movie? Is it worth going to see Star Wars Episode 18 because it's a dollar ninety nine? Well, yeah, maybe, maybe, but you know, I'm not a big Star Wars fan, so I don't really care if it was, uh, you know, a dollar ninety nine or if they paid me a dollar ninety nine to go. You know, yep. it really doesn't make any difference to me. To me, it's two hours of wasted time. So, uh, <laughs> uh-oh, 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 here we go. Star Wars nerds and we all up in your grill now. There we go, here we go. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's that's the type of thing that it is, really. You posted a story up on the loop. How to shoot on the iPhone Seven, and uh, I gotta, I gotta take you to task. You say Apple posted a new web page showing you how to shoot a picture in different situations using the iPhone Seven. This is a page I will definitely use. Have you, Jim? Have you learned? Have you learned anything from the, the, that iPhone Seven page? You know, after I wrote that, <laughs> I, I realized that I, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to be able to shoot anyway. <laughs> So I will just keep taking the blurry pictures that I normally <laughs> take. <laughs> you are determined to not be a good photographer, aren't you? 
you know, you would have to think that I, I am actually making a concerted effort to not be a good I, Exactly. Except right now, it's just you're doing that a spite. I know. Just sheer stubbornness on your part. I And, you know, people ask me to take a picture, uh, you know, of something. They say, oh, take a picture of us. So I'll take a picture. And then they'll pass the camera to somebody, the phone to somebody else and say, hey, can you take a picture of us? <laughs> like, seriously? What? What the fuck? What, what's wrong with the picture I just took? It was crap. Be, besides, it's blurry and you can't make out who's in it. You yeah, know, it, 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 it's truly. I, yeah. I will say, you do have a skill of creating blurry pictures because the iPhone auto focuses, and you still take blurry pictures. I know. I know. You still manage to to to, to make them blurry, which is, which is a skill in and of itself. So you should be slightly proud of that. I don't know why Apple doesn't have me uh, pre-test all of their new <laughs> phones for the camera. Because if they could figure out how to make my pictures yeah. better, then they would probably sell millions more. Because <laughs> pe- people would look and say, wow, look, that guy really sucks at pictures and this is great. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, Jim has got another version of the Dalrymple report up on the, uh, sorry, up on the loop, loop and com. I just checking you, you haven't updated the, uh, the Dalrymple reports webpage, dude. Yeah, I did. I'm looking at it now and it says Dalrymple, Dalrymple report with G, guest James Dimps. Oh yeah. Well, that's, that's weird. Today. It just popped up. Okay. Anyway. Uh, Dalrymple report with uh, guest James Dempsey talking about singing and WWDC coming up in uh, what? It's just a week away or two weeks away, isn't it? Yeah, Next yeah, week. it's cra- crazy. Um, it's going to be a very interesting WWDC, and uh, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fun. Don't forget, if you're going to WWDC, have you started giving out tickets to Beard Bash yet? No, tickets go out tomorrow. Okay, all right. Uh, and folks, can they still email you, or are all the tickets spoken for? No, no, no. I, these are, uh, it's open to everybody. So tomorrow, it'll be wide open. Wide Anybody open. going to WDC can just go in and register for a ticket. You won't have any more fun than at the Beard Bash, folks. So if you're going to WWDC, make sure you, you get a ticket from Jim. Jim, thanks very much for joining me, buddy. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Sean. Have a good night. See ya. You too. Bye. Yeah, if, if, WWDC is, is, is a lot of fun um, if you're a nerd. I, I went once and didn't understand 95% of what was going on, so I haven't bothered to go back. It's just too hard in my brain. Uh, you sit around talking to really, really smart people who are obviously a hell of a lot smarter than you are and talking about things that I just can't, literally cannot comprehend. So there's just no point in me, <laughs> in me, in me, in me spending the money to go to WWDC. In our starting at point photography segment on tonight's show, newbie photography mistakes. These are mistakes I've made at least 10 times before I learned not to make them. They're minor things, and that's why they're so easy to make these mistakes, because they are so minor. I had someone show me a picture over the weekend, well shot picture the the lighting is lovely it was a uh, a beach shot here in vancouver with the sun setting and they were they were asking me about how to stop the sun from being just a, a yellow blob but i also gave them the additional tip they do what so many new uh beginning photographers do our brain tells us that we like symmetry but it turns out when it comes to photography we don't Beginners, and you can look at your old photos and see this on a regular basis. Beginners will put the horizon dead center. They'll have the exact same amount of sky as they do ground or grass or beach or water, whatever it is. Don't do that. Don't have your horizon be dead center of your shot. All you have to do is when you when you frame the shot up, when you see the thing that you like, just Either raise your camera up or tilt your camera down. Just do something to get more sky than ground or more ground than sky. Whichever one is more interesting. If the sky is more interesting, the clouds are really cool, get more sky in there. If the ground or the water is really cool, get more ground or water in there. Just don't have your horizon 
be dead center across the frame. One thing you can do on your iPhone is turn on your grid. I always re recommend folks do this. I've got the grid turned on on my phone all the time, even though I'm nominally a professional photographer. My grid is on all the time because it gives me a little reminder that I don't want to put things in dead center of my photo. So just tilt your camera or raise your camera up or down to get that horizon out of the dead center. It just doesn't look good. You think it does, you think it should, but in fact, it really, really doesn't. One of the other things, and this is a um, very subjective. As I've always said, photography is a subjective thing. So you may look at this in a different way than me. It's don't take boring pictures. And but what I mean by that is find something in the shot you're about to take that's interesting to you or to somebody else. Don't take a picture just because you think you should take a picture. Don't take a picture just because the, the light is good, so you take a picture of that tree. Well, is it an interesting tree? What is there about the tree that attracts you? What is it about the, the, the color of that thing that attracts you? Make the picture interesting. Make it so that someone will react to your picture. We all remember we were kids and, and Grandma brought, brought out that photo album. And you flip through the photo album as fast as you could because the photos were boring. And every now and then you'd stop at one photo and go, Grandma, what's that? Or who's that? Or something attracted your attention to that photo. And that's the key. That's what you want to shoot for in your – now, you won't get it every single time. But that's your goal when you shoot images from now on is you want someone to ask you about the image. Where was it? What is it? Who is it? They, something that attracts their attention to your photo and makes it a non-dull photo. So look for ways to not make your photos dull, whether that be color or composition or a sense of movement or something. Try to look for interesting things in the photograph. We were just talking to Jim about, about focus. Remember on your iPhone, you can choose what's in focus. It's a simple matter of when you get, before you push the shutter button, just tap on the thing. Whatever it is in the shot that you see on your screen, whatever you see on your screen that you think is interesting, tap on it. Because that will make that thing in focus. So you look at, and they also help with a previous shot too. You're looking to find something that's interesting in the shot. And when you find an interesting thing, you tap on it, and that gives focus to the image. It doesn't, because what happens with, cameras is cam a camera doesn't know what's interesting all a camera knows is what you're pointing at it so for example say you're shooting a uh, a flower and there's one flower that's further away than than the other flower well the camera is going to focus on the closest flower almost all cameras will do that they'll focus on the closest thing maybe the closest flower isn't the flower you wanted to shoot maybe the closest flower isn't the most interesting flower Maybe the back flower is. It also gives you the advantage of now your back flower, once you tap on it, will be in focus and the front flower will be out of focus. That's a nice little creative way of looking at the, the shot. It also gives you a sense of depth. When objects in front are out of focus and objects at the, in the background are in focus, there's a, a, almost a 3D sense. Remember, photography is a 2D representation of 3D space. So you're always trying to find a way to add depth to your photos. And one way of doing that is by having elements either in the foreground or in the background be out of focus. It gives that sense of depth. So look for the thing. When you find the interesting thing, tap on the screen and make it in focus. If you're using a uh, DSLR, when you holding your DSLR and you half press the shutter and you see the um, focus points light up in your viewfinder, pay particular attention of where those focus points are being lit up. Quite often, um, it may not be on the thing that you want it to want to be in focus. Don't just stab at the shutter button. Half press, note what is being lit up in your focus points and decide if that's what you want in focus. So on the iPhone, you tap on the screen to create the focus. 
And on a DSLR, when you half press, it, the, the, the camera will tell you what it thinks is going to be in focus. And now you can decide whether or not that's what you actually want to be in focus in the shot. I have an issue that I, I say it jokingly, but it might be true. I think my eyes are on crooked. I, every shot I take with my DSLR is just slightly like four degrees tilted. It's just a little bit of tilt to it. And that can be fixed in, in uh, Photoshop or in your favorite image editing app in Lightroom. All kinds of apps will allow you to straighten those lines out when it comes to horizon lines. Uh, but it's very, very strange. I've noticed this in all my shots. I don't know. I've tried. I, I, I'm sure I'm holding the camera right. But I think maybe I'm just I'm tilting the camera a little bit to the left. And it gives that little four degree tilt to my shots but keep that in mind as you're as you're looking for uh, images and and when there's lines uh, across your image you want to make sure that those lines are are straight another temptation that as a new user I did a lot was over processing was bringing my images into Lightroom or back in the day in Aperture or Photoshop, whatever it might be, and adding too much stuff to it and really making it look strange. Now, if you're creating art, that's different. But if you're just recreating an image that you saw on the beach or while being a tourist, don't use too much processing. One of the things that happens, I've noticed this on my phone, is when I use uh, post-processing apps on the phone, what looks good on the phone doesn't look as good on Twitter or Facebook. So what I tend to do is I'll do my edits on the phone or on the iPad and then just dial it back 10, 15, 20%. I'll get it to where I think it looks good and then I'll take it down a notch. Because I think part of it is the screen of the iPhone. Also, the size. The image isn't as big as I see it on my, on my computer screen. So don't post-process too much for your images. One of the other th common mistakes that uh, I know I made a million times when I was a new um, shooter. Um, ArcSign, oh, so hang on. ArcSign says... Um, HDR, I leave that on all the time. What does it do wrong? Nothing on the iPhone. HDR is very good on the iPhone. HDR is high dynamic range. I leave mine on all the time. HDR goes bad when people use Photoshop or Lightroom or other apps. Do a search on uh, Flickr for HDR, and you'll see some heinous examples of overprocessed photos. But HDR on the iPhone is, is actually very, very good. It, it doesn't overprocess it, it at all. One of the things that I made mistakes on is bad crops. Um, cutting things off too soon. If the thing has a tail, for example, a cat, a dog, don't cut the tail off halfway. A bird, don't cut the tail off halfway. Either cut it off completely or leave it completely in. The other thing is when you crop your photos of people, there's a rule of thumb, don't crop where things bend. So don't crop at the elbow. Don't crop at the wrist. Don't crop at the knees. Don't crop at the hips. Don't crop at the feet, the ankles. Crop mid-shin, mid-thigh, mid-torso, uh, um, mid-chest. Don't crop at the neck or the elbows or the wrist, things like that. So keep that in mind as you're shooting but also as you're post-processing and editing your shots. Don't crop off things, areas of bodies that bend. What's the other? Um, oh, one of the things I, I oh man. <clears throat> the nice folks at Epson, many, this is many years ago, when we were living in Connecticut, Epson invited me down to come see their new photo scanners. And they did the typical press tours type stuff. They, they schmooze you. And one of the things they did was took us to, um, to the Empire State Building. And so I'm shooting at night. I'm shooting handheld on the Empire State Building. So I 
increase my ISO. Remember, ISO increases the light sensitivity of your sensor. So when you're shooting in the dark, handheld, you need to sometimes increase your ISO. And I increased my ISO to like 3200 to get the shots of New York City th that I wanted. So we come down off the, off the Empire State Building. Uh, we go to dinner with the folks from Epson and a bunch of other media folks. Um, we have drinks. We have, a, we, we, we have a great time. The next morning, we're going on a boat trip around uh, you know, the typical around uh, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge and, and uh, Ellis Island and Statue of Liberty. So we're on the boat. I'm taking pictures. Got some, some great shots of the Brooklyn Bridge, some amazing shots of the um, Statue of Liberty. I had never been that close in a boat in the Statue of Liberty. And I really liked the shots. I really liked the way they looked on the camera. I get home that night. I bring all the shots into my uh, photo editing app, and they are shit. Every single one of them. Every shot of the Brooklyn Bridge, every shot of Ellis Island, every shot of the Statue of Liberty. Why? Because I left my ISO at 3200 from the night before. You got to learn when you... The, 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 what I do now is before I go out and shoot, the morning before I go out and shoot, I go through all my settings and neutralize them. Make my ISO 100. Make my, my uh, f-stop 8. Make my shutter speed 200. Make sure everything is set to a neutral setting. Or if I know what I'm going to be shooting, so if I'm going to go down to the horse, the horse track and, and, and shoot horses running by, I'll put my, my uh, f put my Shutter speed at 2,000. I'll put my f-stop at 4. I'll put my ISO at 200. So that way my camera is ready to shoot that. So think about what you're going to shoot and set your camera up for that shot. Don't leave your camera settings, the nighttime settings, and shoot in the daytime. Trust me, they won't look good, and you can't fix them. The, the, the noise level at, the, at that level was so high, there wasn't anything I could do to fix the shots. It was, it was so, so upsetting that I'd been that close to the, the Eiffel Tower, it's Eiffel Tower, the Statue of Liberty, and yet still uh, didn't get any of those shots. What are some of the mistakes that you guys have made in the past? Uh, battery is, is a typical one. I always charge my batteries the night before I go on a shoot because I have gone out and lost battery power after 20 shots. Um, I always make sure my camera cards are reformatted, and I've got a backup camera, at least one backup camera. Sorry, one backup camera. Uh, card on me and I generally got four or five backup cards but I also reformat the cards uh, before I go out the next day um, make a mental inventory of the things you're going to need on the shoot and make sure you have put those out on the kitchen table or put them in the camera bag ahead of time uh, Monty says uh, not having lens cleaning claws with me that's that's a big a big thing you should always go to any optical store Actually, you can probably get them at, at your local drugstore, five for a couple of bucks. And I put them in all my pockets. I've got them in both pockets of my motorcycle jacket. I've got them in my camera bag. I've got them all over the place. I've probably got 10 with me at all times. And the other thing is clean those lenses before you go shooting, too. At night, the night before I plan on going on a shoot, I charge the batteries. I give all my lenses a good cleaning. And I give the lens cap, lens cap a good clean too, because no point in putting cleaning your, your your lens if you then put a dirty lens cap on top of that lens. So I I, I, I brush those off too. Um, so think about what you're going to be shooting and how you're going to be shooting it, and use that as a guideline for what you need to bring with you on your shoot. Send me emails to Sean at yourmaclifeshow.com if you want to tell me your newbie mistakes your horror stories i'm always happy to hear how people have screwed up like i have it's a common question from pat which one is better nikon or camera oh sorry nikon or canon doesn't matter if you're a beginner it doesn't matter for the most part if you're a pro it doesn't matter both nikon and canon make great cameras except for mirrorless they make great dslrs it doesn't matter which one you buy as a beginner, it makes no difference. They're, neither is better than the other overall. One may be able to do one thing better than the other. 
One may be a little faster in this situation or might have a little bit better ISO in this situation, but overall, as a beginner, it's not going to matter. I know pros <clears throat> who will switch Nikon and Canon every year. When it, when it, whenever, whenever Canon brings out a, a new camera, they'll sell all the Nikon gear and buy new Canon gear. And whenever Nikon brings out a new camera, they'll sell their Canon gear and buy new Nikon stuff. Pros just want the best camera, and pros flip back and forth. The new Nikon D5S is supposedly an amazing camera for sport shooters. Not a great portrait camera, but amazing for sport shooters. And I know of at least two Canon guys who sold all their Canon gear to buy Nikons because of the sports capabilities of the Nikons. And they'll switch back in a heartbeat if Canon comes out with a camera that's better than the Nikon when it comes to what they want and what they need. So as a beginner, don't worry about it. Just buy a camera and learn how to use the camera. From James uh, McGinnis, is the difference between a DSLR and a phone's camera decreasing now? It's decreasing, but not a lot. Not so much that if you want to be a serious photographer, that I would say you can shoot just with the iPhone. If you shoot in perfect conditions all the time, your iPhone is a very, very good camera. You can just go to the iPhone Photography Awards website and see some beautiful, beautiful images. Images that you wouldn't know were shot on an iPhone. But the iPhone performance envelope, that range of where it shoots really good shots is a great deal smaller than a DSLR, even a mid-range DSLR. Speaking of range, the iPhone's dynamic range is not as high as a DSLR. The sensor on the iPhone is not as big and not as good as a dedicated DSLR. So if you are shooting in good light, um, subjects that aren't moving, um, things that the iPhone is good at taking pictures of, then shoot with the iPhone. You'll get great shots with the iPhone. But if you want to open up your shooting parameters, you want to shoot action, you want to shoot kids running, you want to shoot your son's soccer game or your baseball game, you want to shoot in low light conditions, uh, you want to shoot in things that aren't perfect, the iPhone doesn't do as good a job as a DSLR right now. I think that's going to stay the same for quite a while, in my opinion. Why should I buy a DSLR camera if I have to change lenses every now and then? <laughs> this is from uh, uh, Michael Johnson. Well, Michael, you change lenses in order to get specific shots. So, you are out in a perfect example. We went, we, I went whale watching last summer and the camera I shoot with the Nikon D 600 is a very, very good camera. The lens I shoot with generally an 18 to 85 is a very, very good lens. But for shooting whale watching whales that are 200 meters away, not so good. I need, a zoom lens. I need a lens that will get me closer to those whales. So that's why I would switch lenses. The reverse is true. A 200 millimeter lens doesn't do me any good when I want to shoot portraits of friends or street photography because I want a smaller lens, a less obtrusive lens. Um, say you wanted to shoot in low light conditions. The Nikon D50, the F with F1.8 aperture is really, really good in the low light conditions. It's not so good for taking pictures of landscapes. So when you get more specific in your photography, when you start thinking, I want to shoot wildlife, or I want to shoot sports, or I want to shoot uh, uh, street life, or I want to shoot portraits, that's when you start using better tools for the job. Use specific tools for the job. And that's why you switch lenses on a camera. Michael Coolis in Richmond, Illinois. 
Hi, Sean. I was wondering if you had any DSLR photography advice for someone with a vision issue. I've recently been diagnosed with photophobia, light sensitivity, caused by a recent eye injury. To combat the sensitivity, I wear a tinted prescription lens in gray. That's about a neutral density 6. I cannot easily take the glasses off to get the shot, as it will aggravate the condition and causes me to tear up and close a damaged eye. Worst part, it's my dominant eye that's got the injury. I'm having issues seeing through the viewfinder as well as the LCD screen after the picture is taken. I'm shooting with a Nikon D80 in RAW, and I know some, some can be done in the di digital darkroom, but I was wondering if you had any tips for photographers that had vision issues or impairments. Um, one of the things you can do, Mike, is, I don't know if this is going to help, but on your D80, you can increase and decrease the brightness of your LCD viewfinder. Now, you may not be able to increase it enough or decrease it enough to make a difference. The problem is, photography is about seeing light. And unfortunately, if you have a light sensitivity because of an injury, you can't see the light. You say that uh, the injury is in your dominant eye. I don't know if the injury is going to heal. I don't know if it's permanent. But one thing you do is practice shooting with the non-dominant eye. And if that one can see better, practice looking at it from the other eye. I don't know much about other issues because photography by its nature is vision, is visual. I don't know if there's a whole lot that can be done in your situation. But if anyone's got any ideas, ArcSign's got a, a great point. Maybe an iPad would be a good choice with a huge screen, possibly. One thing you can do is use a remote on your um, D80 that will send the pictures to your iPhone. Uh, I've used uh, Cam Ranger and Cam Finder. The problem with that is it's a little kludgy in that um, it'd be hard to shoot on the DSLR and then look at the photos on the iPad. You could set the camera up on a tripod and using one of these uh, uh, wireless tethering things, look at the iPad and take the picture from the iPad. That might be a solution for you too. If, you, if, you, 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 yeah. if you're interested in that, let me know and I'll send you some more information about the um, wireless tethering tools that I've used. Uh, will that work with a D80? It's a D50 era camera. Yeah, that's that might be an issue. Although I think <clears throat> because it's wireless on the device, as long as he has the connections, the D80 can attach to the cam finder because the cam finder creates its own wireless base station, basically. Its own wireless internet. Not internet. Um, local net. So, possibly, the D80 could do that. But, Mike, uh, send me some more information. Hopefully, hopefully this is just a temporary thing and, and you're going to get better soon. Sorry, just, to, just deleted that one. Um, Susan asks, how can I take better pictures with a kit lens? Learn how to take better pictures. The kit lens in your beginning camera is a decent lens. You say, Lear how can I learn to take better pictures with the kit lens? What's wrong with the pictures now? Are they blurry? Are they too dark? Are they too bright? Are they, you know, what are the conditions that you don't like the photos you're getting from your kit lens. And perhaps you can change those conditions with the kit lens. Now, if you're talking about, oh, I can't shoot the moon, or I can't get good shots of that deer that's a half mile away, well, your kit lens isn't going to help you with that. But if you're talking about shots just of um, uh, the kids or of street life type things, your kit lens, the 1855 kit lens that most people have, is is pretty good. Um, let me know what you don't like about your shots, and maybe I can help. 
be with with that being a little little bit more specific. Uh, our good friend Lauren, who had a birthday just a couple of days ago, said on the show you and Jim were talking about Windows 10 S being a walled garden, and people paying for the ability to install items from the web. You brought up the idea of Apple implementing something like this, but Apple already has this. They simply don't charge for it. If I'm not mistaken, out of the box, you can only install things from the App Store on a Mac. You don't have to pay for the ability to install other things, but you do, do need to go into your security settings and enable it. Most of us geeks forget because the first time we installed something from the web, we changed the setting and never thought about it again. But the average user only ever installs from the App Store. Just a thought. Thought it was worth pointing out, Lauren. Thanks, Lauren. That's a good point. You're, you're right. I, I hadn't, hadn't thought of it either. Folks, that's it for tonight's show. I want to say thanks very much to uh, Jim Downpool for being on the show and uh, joining us this week. If you have any questions about photography in general or cameras specifically or anything along those lines, send me an email to sean at yourmaclifeshow.com. I love helping folks figure out camera stuff. So until next week, as always, I've been Sean King, and you've been listening to Your Mac Life. Thank you. See ya.